righty. It is going very slowly. It's halfway there. <laughs> this will be already recorded. So, yeah, I've seen before. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. And there we go. We are live. Awesome. Let me grab this link for you. There it is. And share here as well. Boop. All righty. And then we will be ready to go. All right, while you are doing that, I will just say to our audience, welcome to the social hour. My name is Nicole York. I am a photographer, a writer for F Stoppers, an author and a digital artist. And today I have with me an amazing portrait photographer, Wayne Simpson. He is rocking a full awesome mountain man beard uh -huh. due, to, uh, due to being stuck at home for the pandemic but he is bringing some amazing insight into the work that he creates, these really incredible, beautifully lit, very character-driven portraits of super duper interesting people. And he has a book in the works that is featuring these portraits. And I cannot wait to kind of dive into his world and find out what motivates him and how he goes about creating such intriguing portraits. So Wayne, thank you so much for joining me awesome. today. Wow, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, before we get going, I'm for some reason having trouble getting this link over there. All righty, let me see what I can oh, do. Letting me you. copy and paste it over there. That's all right. I can message it to you on okay. Facebook if you can Perfect. pull that up. Let me do that. Ready. Just Reynolds is here. here with us, and he says that uh, your beard's a good look. <laughs> Thank you very much. Welcome, hey, Bert. Just for a quick second here. You are totally good. Um, Tiffin Box says, great to see you both. Wayne, that bear is something else. <laughs> oh, that bear? Yeah, I think she meant beard, but she said bear. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is, it is as scruffily like a bear. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just want to encourage everybody who is here first welcome again and then thank you right. for being here and if you guys have questions for Wayne at any time during the interview please leave those in the comments and we will try to get to as many of them as we can during the course of the interview. In the meantime are you ready sir? Okay I'm ready sorry about that. Right I, oh, I'm no. pretty sure I made the link correctly in photo or in uh, Facebook so we'll see there. Right on we will see. Awesome. So, <laughs> yes, beard. Well, the comments are going to be about my beard, I think. Yep. <laughs> it is a pretty spectacular beard. The, when we first got into the chat, I was like, oh, you were right. You were right. That's a pretty outstanding beard. It's got a lot of character <laughs> <laughs> with its racing stripes. Yeah, that makes me go fast. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Speedy. You got to be when you're chasing kids around. Yep. <laughs> So um, as we were talking before we went live, you were telling me that your photography story actually has a really interesting beginning. So I would love to share that with everybody, how you first actually got into photography. How I first got into it, yeah. Um, I don't know how far back to go here. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let's my, go my with learning style? under fire. Let's go with learning under fire. Okay. Um, yeah, I actually started out as a graphic designer. Um, I was working for a large oil company in Calgary for the head office. And uh, I, I was basically hired as a graphic designer uh, with an interest in photography, which I had. I didn't know they were going to send me with the CEO of the company and put me on private jets and whatnot. And, you know, basically make me learn under fire. So uh, at the end of every shoot with the CEO, I would have to deliver you know, a booklet with contact sheets and show every picture I took. And let me tell you, I learned very quickly. Yeah, I bet. Sleep. <laughs> I bet. Uh, I can't imagine how stress inducing that must be feeling like yeah. you're running around risking your job on something you really don't 
understand how to do as well as oh, you should for, sure. for having that be your job. Yeah. That has to be incredibly stressful. So what actually kept you photographing at that point? Because I can only imagine learning under stress like that. I might have been tempted to be like, nope, I'm done now. I don't ever <laughs> want to do that again. Actually, it was funny. I, I mean, it was super painful in the beginning, um, but I caught the bug like everybody does. And uh, eventually I ended up, I knew I liked photography. So I went and I bought my own equipment. I just bought like a was it a Nikon D70 or something in a 80 to 200 lens? Sure. And I wanted to show them what could be done with better equipment at the events mm -hmm. I was photographing. Because they were sending me out with like a point and shoot camera. Right. Photographing the CEO of an oil company. So once they saw what could be done, then they purchased all the top of the line gear for me. And uh, that just started my learning curve right there. So, yeah. Yeah. Clever. I wouldn't trade it for the world. It, it was the worst and best experience. I can understand that. So <laughs> what pulled you away then from photographing the CEO to doing portraits and commercial work on your own? It just got old. Uh, you know, always doing the golden handshake pictures and uh, podium shots. And it, there was no leeway for any creativity. And every time I would try to be creative I would kind of get knocked back into line and I, I just couldn't do it anymore. So as a graphic designer I have to imagine you've been attracted to art for yeah. I mean is that something that you grew up with or did you fall into graphic design later? Actually very in the very beginning it was more fine art. Okay. And, uh, I, I wanted to make a living somehow with art so uh, graphic design seemed to make sense. Um, not to say that, uh, you know, a fine artist can't make a great living, but it just seemed like a smart decision for me at that time. Sure. And, uh, yeah, I, I just went with that and, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, that makes sense. And <laughs> so did you, were you, for me, I know I was a, a drawer as a kid. I drew and I wrote stories and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it. I always knew I would be in some kind of creative field eventually. It was this similar for you? Oh yeah, always. I always knew I would be. Was there something that motivated you as a child to create things? I know for me, it was anything make-believe. I Princesses and unicorns and you know, I wanted to live in a make-believe world. Um, was there something that motivated you as a kid? I don't know that there was one exact thing, but other than just being terrible at things like math and uh, science. And <laughs> so I, I just enjoyed the things I was good at, I guess. Yeah, that's I understandable. Just kept on going with it. Sure. Um, <laughs> we have Chris is here and Katrina Plazic is here as well. Hey guys, welcome. <laughs> so you had that kind of history, a long history then of the arts and then moving in it looked like graphic design was a profitable idea. And then photography was strangely kind of forced upon you a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so you realize that you can't, you don't have the freedom to be creative the way you want to. And so what was it like taking the step to walk away from what I can only imagine must have been a pretty good paying job? Yeah, it, it was scary. Um, my wife and I at the, I was gonna say my wife and I at the time, it's the same way. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we were living out west in Calgary and uh, we had we were uh, about to have our first child and, and so we started planning to move back to Ontario to be around family and so I made the decision then that I was you know done working for the oil company and uh, basically just started booking weddings uh, ahead of time for the next year so I think that first year we booked like 16 weddings or something from a different wow. province. Wow. And in uh, a way I went doing weddings at that point. <laughs> wow, that is a crazy jump. I mean, although granted you were shooting events at the time, so you did have kind of that experience of having to work in unexpected circumstances and still get the shot. So I can imagine yeah. that set you up a little bit to do weddings. Well, it's perfect training for something like a wedding. Yeah. yeah. Lots of pressure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, other than how a wedding day goes, I had to learn that pretty quick. Right. 
So, and then you're doing weddings and I imagine probably other portraits as well. Yeah, uh, so weddings, um, yeah, I, I was attempting to do portraits. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I was basically, in my very beginning stages, I was more into landscape photography. And mm -hmm. as soon as I introduced people, it, I don't know, for some reason I thought it was okay that I just put a little tiny person in a landscape and we'll call it a portrait. And, uh, you know, I'll specialize in lighting if I just throw some light at them and lift the shadows kind of thing, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, eventually um, I got braver and braver and started experimenting with light. And, uh, yeah, my I actually got a real good swift kick in the butt from my buddy Dave Brosha. Oh, really? Do, uh, yeah. He... he he was liking what he was seeing of my work. He was, I think, a little further ahead than me at that point. Sure. And uh, he said, buddy, you got to do some personal work. You got to experiment. You got to get out there and you got to, you know, do something for you. And that, that changed my life. That's the first shoot I did. It just, uh, yeah, I, I was experimenting with light with no pressure of a client, right? Sure. And I, I got to see what could actually be done. And, and uh, eventually, you know, one of the images that came up on the camera on that first shoot just changed everything. I, I never looked back from there. That was the moment, huh? Yep. Yep. So first, thank goodness for awesome supportive spouses. And then thank goodness for friends who aren't willing to tell us the truth and give us good advice. Yeah. And he can so, be brutal to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have definitely <laughs> found that some of the best friends to have are the ones who are not afraid to hurt your feelings. <laughs> um, Gail Stefan is here, tuning in from Surrey, BC, and hey. welcome. Um, don't forget, guys, if you have questions, please put those in the comments and we'll try to get to them as we can. So um, you mentioned also before when we were talking a little bit before we went live that there were a few photographers who inspired your approach to photography. Um, maybe we can talk about that a little bit because I think a lot of our viewers probably can sympathize with that journey of discovering your style. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, well, in the beginning, I, I definitely felt like, like everybody does, uh, you know, what is, what is my style? Where, when am I going to find my style? And I've heard that so many times from other people. Uh, I was there too. Um, yeah, definitely a few photographers that that definitely inspired me. Uh, Joey L. He he probably doesn't know it, but we're from the same hometown. Ah. <laughs> um, Lindsay Ontario. Uh, Joe McNally. He's always always been an inspiration. His layering of light. He's just he's just a master. Um, who else? Joel Grimes, Drew Gardner. Those are a few key ones that kind of stand out to me. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, definitely tried in the beginning to create what they were creating, to try and, you know, analyze what they were doing and, and figure out exactly how they create the look, whether it was the post-processing or the light. And uh, to tell you the truth, I basically failed miserably. And the good thing is that that was the birth of my own style. Right. So all those inspirations combined and then my failed attempt made a style. So <laughs> I love the fact that failure or at least a perceived failure can often be the thing that unlocks the door for us. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Especially considering how many of us try to avoid failure at all costs. And so, which is interesting because having your friend give you that advice of doing personal work, well, where then failure does become an option and that ability to take chances and to maybe not succeed is what can lead to some of our biggest growth. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So when he gave you that advice to do personal projects at that point, did you already have something in your mind that you had been wanting to try, but hadn't done yet? Or how, I guess the question is the people that you photograph. So for um, our audience, 
first, let's go ahead and describe the kind of work you're doing now. Oh, you want me to describe it? Yes. <laughs> um, I guess you would call them, for the most part, character portraits. Mm -hmm. uh, I just love to find people that make me do a double take. People that, for some reason, are visually interesting to me and, and just catch my eye. Um, I'm in a fortunate situation. Uh, my, we talked about this. My my wife is is the breadwinner in our household. She's awesome, and luckily I'm able to pursue the kind of photography I love to do because of that. Uh, yeah. So, sorry, I just <laughs> lost my train. <laughs> I'm getting right. old. Forty five years old. <laughs> what was I just saying? You, you're pursuing the kind of photography you want to do, people that catch your oh, yeah, interest. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, so, yeah, I, how would I describe it? For some reason, I tend to be drawn to people that uh, demonstrate some kind of resilience, for sure. Mm. Um, so I, I've seen it a few times where I've actually, you know, I've been, I've been drawn to how somebody looks, but then... Right. I learned later that there's like this amazing story behind them. And that is true a lot of the time. Yeah. But the funny thing is, as I get, as I keep going, I'm realizing that there are so many stories everywhere that just blow your mind. People ask me all the time, you know, how do you find these people? And the truth is I've started opening my eyes to it and I'm just looking all the time now. Right. You know, be sitting somewhere and you hear people talking and you'll pick up on a conversation and it's like some crazy story and so you know I've been learning that not everybody has like an epic beard or a grizzled up face or something and right. to have a crazy story so I don't know if I just answered your question I just went on a tangent there no that's okay I just I, I kind of wanted to set up um, the question by explaining the kind of work you do for people who might not be aware. And in fact, let me, I can actually pull this up really quickly and then we can just share it here. Sure. Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to set that up a little bit because I think the big question, at least for me, we'll share that so everybody can see, is that appearing? Yep. Perfect. So the question for me then becomes, what draws you to these people? So you have a friend who, you know, is encouraging you to do personal work. And how does this become that work? Um, because for me, if somebody was encouraging me to do personal work, I would be like, oh, I could make the most epic fantasy stuff. Like, let me turn somebody into a fairy or, <laughs> or something like that. That is where my mind goes. So what is it that makes this what you want to create when somebody suggests doing personal work and this is where you go? How does that happen? Um, it's progressed, actually. Uh, in the beginning, I would say it was just the subject matter I was drawn to visually, mm -hmm. but it's changed. It's uh, Now it's become a lot more real, uh, a lot more heartfelt, a lot more personal. Mm -hmm. um, there was one image a ways back there that was my mom, and oh, wow. uh, or is she the far right corner, top right corner, was oh, the red. Right. So, yeah. And I mean, what a lovely kitchen! Please tell me this is her kitchen. <laughs> yeah. So just a um, real quick story about this. Um, my mom's been through a lot of horrible things in her life and I, I never knew about her past. Mm. We just never talked about it. And I, I knew not to bring it up, but I couldn't live with making a book centered around resilience ah. and not including my own mom and learning her story. And so, you know, photographing all these people, I've, I've, I've managed to really get to know them personally and and you know understand them and what they've been through and everything and, and it was a perfect opportunity to get to know my own mother mm. so it was a 
I, I won't get into the details of what I learned, sure. but it, it was a crazy, powerful thing for me. So yeah. Oh, I can only imagine. So then you were saying that it has kind of then developed over time. Um, yeah. So how has it developed? What was that process like for you? Um, in the beginning, you know, I would see somebody and I would, uh, I would approach total strangers and it, it took a lot of, a lot of uh, developing the guts to do it kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but eventually, you know, I would, I would approach people and, and ask if I could photograph them based on how they looked. Mm -hmm. um, since starting this book, it's actually led me to seek out people that are you know, just amazing people with these fantastic stories. And uh, yeah, so now I'm just always paying attention and always searching. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of changed. It used to be a lot more organic, but I'm doing everything I can to keep it as organic as possible still. Sure. And so what's the process like when you find somebody that's really interesting and you think you'd love to photograph them? How do you then approach that? Um, I try my best not to be creepy for starters. <laughs> <laughs> not being creepy is always good advice. I haven't approached anyone with this beard yet, so I don't know. Oh so man, that, you're going to have to try that at least once before you get rid of it. It might be your superpower. <laughs> um, for starters, I just try to be, you know, as as open and human as possible. As soon as I mention I'm a photographer, I, I've had people kind of shut down. Mm. Like, oh, you want to take my picture and charge me money? That's kind of right. the first reaction. But I make sure that I tell them right up front. I, you know, I'm not looking for any money. Um, I love to photograph people with a lot of character and, and you have the most amazing look about you uh and i would love to photograph you if you'd let me and then i i always have my phone with me with all these images on there sure <laughs> and so yeah and then i make sure i tell them stress you don't have to give anything other than your time and i will share the images with you send you some prints mm -hmm. yeah and so for the most part people are receptive Sure. Well, I mean, if you approached me and then showed me these images and said you wanted to photograph me, I would be like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I cannot blame them. Um, so when you first started this project, then did you have anything in mind for a finished product? I know that now you're working on a book and of course we'll definitely get to that, but, but was that something you planned from the beginning? Did you have an idea for this or did you just want to be creating work that you were intrigued by? I had no plan. I, I just wanted to be happy creatively and that's kind of what set me on the journey. Sure. And it, it just, the longer it went on, the more I realized that every one of these experiences with people uh, is life-changing and life enriching in some way, whether it's big or small, you know, people like Brian here that you see with the fire there, mm -hmm. uh, I probably would have never met him if I hadn't approached him on the street and, and learned about him and photographed him. So, and, and there's countless people that that's been the case with. So, sure. uh, you know, I've, I've managed to really change my outlook on life based on all these people that I've, I've photographed and yeah, I don't know how much to get into right now, but it, crazy. No, right. <laughs> no, I love that. I mean, I think, um, I think that that's such an important and poignant part of what we do and why what we do can make such an incredible difference is because we're exposed to all of these different people and sometimes running a portrait studio you might be able to just um you might be able to just you know have people come in and out and set things up and take a picture and be like bye um yeah. but when you make it a point to actually get engaged with these people and learn about their lives and find out about what they've been through and who they are. I think it's such an incredibly enriching 
experience, like you said, it changes who you are. And I think it, it broadens the world for you in a lot of ways. Yeah. There's uh, the most recent, actually not the most recent, but the shoot before that, um, a, a woman named Leona Sky. The most unreal story I've ever heard. Um, she's a survivor of trafficking. Oof. And, uh, you know, I, I knew that that existed, but I had no idea how naive I was. Right. And what an eye-opening experience to be, you know, I, I traveled to her home in Niagara Falls and I photographed her in, uh, in her home. I didn't know her mom was going to be there. And I learned that her and her mom had been apart for many years and just recently reunited. Oh, wow. And so as I did the interview process, uh, as Leona spoke and, and told, you know, horrifying details and, and just, you know, spilled her, her guts to me. Um, her mom had heard a lot of that stuff. So she yeah. was hearing it the oh. first time too. And God. oh man, there were, there were tears from all of us. It was just such a powerful thing. And, you know, now knowing that there's those things out there, it, you know, it, some might not want to know, right. but I prefer to know. So anyway, that, that's one example that's recently that, that was extremely powerful. Yeah. And then, um, so before I continue asking you a bunch of questions, um, we'll get to a few of the questions that we have from the commenters. So Chris sure. said that he loves the quality of the light you're using. Um, Thank you. So just because I know people will definitely ask, and even though it's not personally my thing. I know people want to know what are you using for light and modifiers? Uh, my early work, I was using Allen Crumb uh, uh, Ranger mm -hmm. as a light. Usually, well, one or two lights, so a Ranger and a Quadra. And then I would use uh, the Allen Crumb modifiers. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Deep Opta. 39 inch octa and the was it 135 centimeter octa were kind of my go-tos sure nowadays for probably the last how many years has it been maybe five years i've used all pro equipment actually um you so that, broke up a little bit there you said you use what strobe pro okay so that's like uh flashpoint godox they're all kind of similar sure and yeah so i use their lights, which are the cordless, you know, battery powered ones on location. Mm -hmm. And I still tend to use my Deep Octa and my 135. I Excuse love me. the shit out of that Deep Octa, I gotta say. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of my yeah. favorite those, modifiers those are ever. still my favorites, but yeah. I, I do have, I use some of the, uh, some of the other ones too in a pinch, but, and they do a great job, but I just have, there's just a thing about those two modifiers. There is. I agree. I agree. Um, and then Gail is asking, how did you come to the term resilience to focus on? Um, that's a good question. It just kind of really fell in my lap. I guess that's just the type of stories and um, looks that I'm drawn to. Um, you know, when you can see a story on someone's face, you can tell sure. that they've been through some things. Uh, I, I just, I love the story that's there. And yeah. so I, I think that's what kind of drew me to it. So in a way it was the people who revealed the word to you through yeah, just absolutely. who they were. That is yeah. super duper cool. Um, uh, Gary would like to know, Gary Monroe would like to know, do you believe the photo is incomplete without people knowing the person's story? That's a great question. I, I've, yeah, it is. I've sort of questioned that lately, actually, like if my work stands on its own without the person's story. Um, I don't, I don't think it's incomplete. I, there's something to be said for leaving some of the story to the viewer's imagination, I think. Sometimes mm -hmm. that can make it more powerful. But in the case of Leona Sky, for example, that is, I have written about 
about Leona and, and shared her story and, and it is extremely impactful. And those images would have nowhere near the same impact without the writing. So I, I think it's kind of dependent on the individual story, I guess would be my answer. Sure. My answer and is I that no certainly, answer. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it is. Sometimes there isn't a definitive answer. You know, I think we like to really have everything spelled out for us, but sometimes the answer really is just sometimes. I mean, yeah. um, I certainly think that your work has innate power of its own that's only increased then knowing the story. Like not knowing the story doesn't diminish the work, I think, but knowing it does enhance it. So it's definitely, right. it's able to live that life on its own, I think. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah at least from my perspective. <laughs> um, and let's see, uh, we, are, we are talking up your workshops in the comments section right now. <laughs> um, so that is awesome. And let's see, Gail says, with that beard, you would make a great subject. Very interesting. I keep thinking I gotta figure, I, I've never, I don't think I've done a self portrait, portrait before, so. Ah, I need to do that before this thing comes off. Indeed, you do. <laughs> the world needs that, Wayne. Um, uh, Scott Abels asks, "Do you just find people at random? So, how do you manage to come across your subjects?" I get asked that a lot, actually. Uh, a lot of times, I just take the long way everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> take the long way everywhere, and I watch and. Uh, I, I've been known to just stop at some random place for a beer and just sit and observe, um, you know, a, a legion or something or a, some dive bar somewhere. Mm -hmm. I, I find the people that you find are just amazing in some places. <clears throat> um, that being said, you know, when we moved to Elora, what was it six or seven years ago now, six years, I think, uh, you know, I just sort of started taking note of people as they said them in different places and just sort of observing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I, I just watch all the time. Right. I guess. That, the and that in itself is a skill. I mean, that's that's an ability that you build up to be able to pay attention and, and be perceptive, right? Yeah. I challenge everybody out there to to actually pay attention and think to yourself when you see people if they if that would make a really intriguing portrait that person's face and like every day you see these people the hardest part is not being able to photograph them all because not everybody yeah. says yes <laughs> this is true i can imagine you having to walk away from somebody who has a really intriguing look and just being like no why painful yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Stories just dying to be told out there. Yeah. Um, so uh, Katrina is asking, are there any stories out there that you want to tell and you're seeking out people for? Yes. Oh. Um, one comes to mind right now. I know there's more. Yeah, there's... <laughs> There's one really interesting gentleman in Alberta, lives in the middle of nowhere. I have met him and I have seen his trailer in the middle of a field in the middle of nowhere. He actually is in his 80s and used to be a drug mule. Oh, wow. Up until recently, he would fly and just drop drugs where he was told to drop them. <gasps> wow. And now he's basically hiding out in this field the rest of his life oh my goodness and he's just fascinating he lives with his son who is equally fascinating so that's wow one. but i need to get to alberta and i can't seem to travel lately so yeah 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 that puts kind of a damper on the entire thing <laughs> so that's, um, that's super cool um we'll get to a couple more questions and then i'm gonna start bugging you about your book because i know people are sure. going to be curious as a photographer how you kind of make that happen and how that works so um tiffenbox is asking you've recently mentioned how writing plays a part in your creative process so she's interested to hear more about working on that skill set and how it comes into play 
Um, sorry, I got sidetracked. It's a he, actually. Oh, oh, excuse me. It's a he. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. I, I think I see the Tiffin and immediately think Tiffany because I've known so oh, yeah, many yeah. Tiffany's. So forgive me, please. So sorry. I, too, um, I, I couldn't stop thinking that as you were talking, so I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. I'm glad you said it because I, I definitely don't want to misgender anybody. Um, <laughs> So uh, Tiffin Box is asking, recently you have mentioned how writing plays a part in your creative process. Can we hear more about how we could start working on that skill as well? Hmm. Um, yeah, I think what I really found um, a few years ago was, was how much emotion the writing part can bring. You can, you can inject a certain amount of motion just in the image, you know, right. with with the use of light and everything and expression, but when you add words to it and tell the person's story, you know, in a, in a way that enhances that, that, that really ups the emotion. Um, yeah, I think especially uh, honoring the person's story and really be sensitive to who they are and, and doing the writing in a way that can help them or, shed light on the great qualities that that person has is a big deal, I think. Um, I don't know if I'm answering the question really. <laughs> Sorry, was it, it was pointers about introducing writing? Yeah, I think- um, I can't see the question, sorry. It, it seems a little bit like they're asking how that plays into the creative process and how people might be able to use that for right, themselves. Okay. Um, definitely. So not every time do I get to learn about the person before I photograph them, but I do find that when I learn about them beforehand and, you know, I can even maybe start the writing before I've done the shoot. Sometimes that's useful because you know, I get to know more about that person and know what kind of environment would make sense to photograph them in, mm -hmm. what things may be from their past that we can bring in. Uh, for example, <clears throat> there's one gentleman, Emmer Court, that I photographed in North Rustico, Prince Edward Island. Um, he's a, a World War II veteran. So, you know, bringing, you know, some of the medals into play and things like that. Uh, I, I just think it can help bring more story to the visual as well as the text if you learn more about them. Sure, and then I know at least, um, and I'll just interject a little bit, as a writer and an author myself, I certainly find writing about somebody else increases your empathy for them a hundredfold because Absolutely. as you're writing about them, you have to live in their head a little bit and, and yeah. put yourself in their shoes, so. Um, I can certainly see how starting that even before you put your visuals together can make you much more mindful about image creation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. I can certainly see that. Um, Bobby Thompson would like to know, what is your process or thought process for the location that you photograph the subjects in? Right, so that, that kind of goes with the previous one. Um, definitely story is first. Mm -hmm. Uh, I always want to add to the story visually. Um, as far as aesthetics go, I love to have some level of depth whenever I can so that I have the option to have, you know, maybe a wider shot that that has, you know, I can introduce some backlight, for example, and, and some separation layers, some fall off of focus, things like that. Um, but then also have the option to just go in there with a tight lens and just do something really simple. Sure. So yeah, just, just looking for a location where I can do that is, right. is pretty key. So story first and then flexibility. Yeah. yeah. Right. That makes a lot of sense, especially when you're trying to kind of, so is though, are those kind of three main things that you try to get out of every shoot where you have that kind of wider establishing shot that shows, character and then moving into the tighter more kind of intimate portrait yeah i uh, in the early days i i wasn't on my game enough to know to do that but i found that it comes in really handy now so right. yeah like showing the environment um even sometimes just having the eyes closed kind of just getting a, a feeling 
instead of the actual visual of the eyes. Uh, and then, yeah, I always like to do a real extreme close up to really get into the eyes. Right. Yeah, I like that. And I then think. lately, actually, a lot more details as far as like there's one shot in there of my mom's hands. Um, it's a black mm. and white shot, and it's it's just her hand with a, a very significant tattoo, and she's holding a um, a braid of sweet grass. So it's all there's a lot of story just in that one image, right? Sure. Yeah, I, it's amazing to me always how much hands communicate even when they're not doing anything specific. Um, one of the only documentary style photographs I've ever taken that is a fine art photograph. I was actually visiting my husband's family sitting next to his great grandmother on the couch and she was holding our youngest baby. And she had her hands crossed on a pillow in front of her and her ring was showing. And then in the room around were her daughters um, going, it was, I think, five generations in that room. And they were just, everybody was sitting and talking, but window light was spilling in. And so I, I had the little point and shoot camera and I just kind of snuck it over there. But it's the main focus is her hands. And there's just something so powerful about the story that is in the skin of, of people who have lived a life that's so compelling. Absolutely. Um, and then uh, we'll get these last couple of questions um, and then we'll take a break from, from questions for a little bit and move on. Following with Scott's question, do you have a story of how you interacted with a specific subject in order to convince them to participate, participate, participate <laughs> in a shoot? Um, maybe somebody who was reluctant? Hmm. Good question. You know what? I don't, I don't think I do. I wish I had a story. It, it's always been very cut and dry. Um, usually somebody either is in right away or right. they're just totally not into it. I've, I've had people before I even get the words out of my mouth, not interested. Ah, uh, Yeah. <laughs> And I don't want to, I don't want to push them, right? Because sure. that, that's probably just not going to work out if I'm always pushing. Right. Um, this is different than what they're asking, but I have had an instance where somebody has agreed. Um, it, it was a very sensitive one. Um, it's a woman who uh, lost two sons at different times, both times to drunk drivers. Oh God. And she actually really, like she was working with uh, Mothers Against Drug Drivers and, sure. and uh, you know, speaking to large groups. And, and so I could see she was actively trying to get the word out and, and do this. So I approached her very respectfully and she was all in. But then her, her own mental health, I noticed, started to take a, a little bit of a turn and I had to make the call myself to just right. call that off. And I already knew the shots I was going to do. It was, it was going to be so touching and just a, a tragic story, but an important story to tell. Mm -hmm. But I just couldn't, I couldn't drag her through that. So yeah. yeah, not related to that question, but. Sure. But still an important story to hear. Yeah. Um, kind of following along that line of thought, what, is the general reaction to your subjects when they see the images of themselves? Usually it's either just a pretty quiet, huh, you know, they like it, but they don't say a lot. Right. Uh, but I've had a few people, one that really stood out to me, a man named Grizz, he was actually the first, the first guy that I photographed that I told you about. His reaction really stuck with me. He basically said that, he said that the way I photographed him is the way he feels he looks. So like kind of larger ah. than life. He's a man that he, he loves to dress in like, um, like old Western gear, but kind of sure. like, more like a reenactment, not really the role. Right. And so it's just a thing he likes to do. So I photographed him in the most kind of badass way I could. And that was how he saw himself. Right. So he just loved them. And so, yeah, I don't know. I, I think for the most part, people are pretty proud. 
Sure. Um, and it seems like a, a lot of those kind of people, at least a lot of the ones uh, that I've seen on your website, almost seem like they might be the type of people to be a little bit more reserved with their reactions. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you're creating this body of work. Um, you don't necessarily have a plan for it at first. If you don't mind my asking, at that point, how are you funding your shoots? Uh, I was just shooting. <laughs> there was no funding. <laughs> well, I mean, you're still, you know, you're needing to drive places and have gear and, and things like that. Is that kind of one of those, it's a joint effort, you know, between you and your wife to kind of facilitate yeah. this, this creating of work or, cause I noticed you also had been doing some commercial work as well. Um, yeah. So, um, when my wife and I were expecting our second daughter, so at this point I have, we have a seven-year-old daughter and a three-year-old daughter. Um, when our three-year-old was expected, we made the decision that, um, you know, my wife saw how much I love this type of portraiture and that that's where my heart was. And so we decided together that I would just go for it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, eventually she moved into the breadwinner role and- sure. Uh, so it progressed into me being part-time stay-at-home dad, you know, doing all the drop the kids at school or daycare and, and watching them several days a week and, and all that stuff. Um, and my wife working full-time and, and then the rest of my time I would pursue the, uh, the photographs I wanted to make. Mm -hmm. so, and yeah. then, and that kind of partnership has now, reached its fruition as you are close to publishing your book. So tell us about how that came about. Um, it was funny. I had reached out to the publisher at uh, Rocky Mountain Books. They're an amazing publisher out of Vancouver. Um, <clears throat> I've, got, I've got a couple of friends uh, that have done books with them before and I knew they're a, a great publisher. And uh, I heard from a friend that they they knew of my work and I was kind of on their radar and my friend said you you might want to you know touch base with them there might be something there and so eventually I did that went quiet for quite a while and then I I learned from the same friend again that uh, they had a slot a slot available to put a book project into and uh, I reached out again and they replied and away we went so Right on. Yeah. So what has that process been like for you then? Uh, it's, it's been challenging on my end because I, I can't just run out and just find a subject all the time. You know, right. there's a certain amount of material that I want to have in there and I, I don't want to compromise the quality of it. And so it's been a major process trying to, to get enough. Mm -hmm. It started as an organic thing, and then I started more searching for people, right? Right. So, uh, so I ended up delaying a year at first, and so now, come uh, September second here, my material is due, and then September, early September twenty twenty one is when the book is supposed to come out. Right on. And I'm very thankful I made that decision actually because um, some of my most powerful portraits and stories have come lately and they wouldn't have been in the book so right it's all working out yeah so um what is the pressure like of having to work under that deadline knowing that you have just kind of a few short months to compile the rest of the images and the story that you need to finish the book well it wasn't too bad until the pandemic hit and yeah <laughs> <laughs> i've lost a couple months here and so um, it's been a little bit of pressure because this, this isn't just, you know, by no means am I making a book to make money. I'm, I'm making this because I actually care about the material and producing the, the stories representing the people well. Mm -hmm. and so th there's a lot of energy going into it. Sure. So. so if you were to have any advice for photographers who maybe would like 
to go the publishing route. Um, is there anything that you might say to them for maybe how they could approach doing something like that? Hmm. Definitely uh, making sure that you have something unique that hasn't been done a million times before uh, is helpful. Um, I, I know there's been a lot of photo books done and there's there are things like uh, uh, humans of New York and things like that. Right. But I, I feel like I'm doing something a little different than that. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the main thing. And, and be confident, pull your strongest work together, put together a good pitch. Yeah, that, that's about all I got. I'm a little bit new to it too. <laughs> sure, sure. Have you learned any really important lessons during this process of gearing up for your book? Um, don't take any time off. <laughs> well, so I, in the beginning, the first year that I was working on it, I, I was like every day I was stressing about it. So I was, I was not stopping. And then I started to kind of burn out a bit and it was getting to me and the family and everything. Yeah. As soon as I realized that I had another year because I had to delay it. Um, I relaxed a little too much ah. and I regret that because, you know, I should have predicted a pandemic. So, right. Right. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway. So I, don't take time for granted, huh? Yes. Yes. The, those are wiser words than don't stop working. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it means the same thing. It means the same thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely can understand that. I think it's sometimes we can put too much pressure on ourselves and then default to the opposite side where we go, we know that we need a break and then we take a break so hard that we kind of fall off the wagon. Oh, that's absolutely, so, you know, it was one extreme or the other. Yeah, which is, it's such a difficult thing. I know as photographers, we talk about a lot, finding that work-life balance where you can still take care of the kids and actually have a relationship with your spouse and maybe have a hobby or some free time. And then the other side is, you know, making sure that you're still creating work and that you're staying relevant and that you're not kind of losing your steam. And it's strange how it seems to fall so hard on one side or the other. Absolutely. A difficult balance to maintain. <laughs> yeah. Do you find, and I, I've talked to a couple of other parents about this, um, those of us who are photographers and parents, do you ever feel like there is something working against you within the industry? And what I mean by that is there certainly seems to be, for those of us who are parents and photographers, um, at least for momtographers, I know <laughs> that, that that's like a, a naughty word, right? Like there, there's a kind of a strange stereotype against that subset right. of photographers. Do you ever feel that as a dad? Is that something as, as kind of a stay at home dad who is also a photographer? Is that, do you ever kind of get that feeling from the industry or uh, have you experienced anything like that? I think I have, no. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of people don't really know my situation. They just think mm. I work full time as a photographer. So right. uh, I haven't really had that. Um, I would say my biggest enemy in the industry is time. Sure. If anything. Uh, yeah. I mean, for me to take a commercial job and, you know, somewhere like an hour away from here, that's a full day gig. I, I can't really even take it cause I got to be home to pick up my daughter. And, yeah. and so it's, it's pretty tricky that way. So yeah, yeah. time's my biggest enemy, like any, anyone, I guess. Sure definitely have that experience. So um, as quickly, I want to let our viewers know. So we're coming up on our hour. We will soon be there. So if you guys have more questions, please make sure to get them in now so we can address them before we close. Having said that, um, so you have the book on its way and your little one is only a couple years away from kindergarten. Do you have plans for where your career is going to go after that once you have some time freed up? Uh, 
my plan is that I'm actually going to have time to think of a plan. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> um, yeah, honestly, man, it's amazing. Like I, I remember when I used to be able to sit down and think clearly, but it was a long time ago. Um, I, I, I think I'll just pour a lot of time into uh, new workshops. Uh, I want to say I'm going to, you know, do another photo project or something, but this never, this was never set out to be just a project. It's just what I love to do. So I don't really know what that looks like. We'll see. I might take a turn somewhere. I don't know. Yeah. Who knows what the future might bring. Yeah. Um, And our workshops, workshops, (laughs) I have all the best words. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Um, is workshops something that you um, enjoy or is that something I know some people who have gotten into kind of the the workshop circuit as a way to just kind of supplement their income and some who do it because they just absolutely love it what is that like for you uh, I, I love it yeah I, I would love to actually do more local workshops around I'm in Elora Ontario so somewhere at least in Ontario Mm-hmm. would be nice um i like to travel but it gets old when you have kids and you got to work out alternative sure. plans and all the rest of it so uh yeah i i love them honestly it's a weird rush when you're in the middle of one and you're helping people and it's just a good feeling it's nice to nice to help people i agree there's something really special about watching that click in somebody's mind where they realize finally the, the thing, the one thing they've been missing to make what they want to make. And they realize that there's such a good feeling of having been a part of that. And I feel like it's the perfect circle kind of for me because I shoot the kind of stuff that I love to shoot. People see it. Some of them like it. They want to learn how to do it. So it's basically marketing for my own business. Right. And so sure, I think it's a, a good, a good circle. Yeah. And it's a win-win because you get to kind of engage with people and help them and then they're helping you as well. So, yeah. All right, cool. So we have a couple more questions coming in before we close. Um, Gary says, do you foresee yourself doing a follow-up in the future for how your subjects are doing in a decade or so? Hmm. I hadn't really planned on it, but that being said, um, there are a couple of people that I've photographed multiple times and I have followed up, you know, two, three, five years later kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So um, there are some key people that I will be following up on because a lot of my subjects tend to be elderly. Right. And I, th- I think it's really important to photograph them as much as I can. Sure. So, you know, there's already been um, a couple that have, have passed since I've photographed them. So um, the more I can do, the better. So I suppose the answer is yes, but not necessarily a specific project doing that, but I would like to follow up. Yeah. Sure. Um, and then Tiffin Box, your photographs have all been processed. At what point do you say I'm done working on this photograph? It's a good question. It, it changes from one to the next, really. Uh, Usually I'll, I'll, I'll process something and then I'll kind of step away from it for, for the night kind of thing. And then right. look at it with fresh eyes. And more often than not, I've gone too far with something and I tone it down a bit. So it's usually, you know, I might put a total of an hour or two at the most into the processing, but it will be over a couple of days. So I have fresh eyes, but that being sure. said, there's some that are pretty much ready to go right out of camera with a few touch-ups so right is there certain things that you do to each photograph as far as maybe color grading or clarity issues or you know what are what are some of the things that you are hallmarks of your style of editing um i would say i definitely uh desaturate things a lot i i tend to like instead of having you know like a bright pop of color in an image i like to have a cohesive palette it's okay. Kind of what I'm drawn to. <laughs> I say that as there's a picture behind me with a bright pop of color. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, it seems um, like you rely a little bit more on light to separate your subject than you do on color. Yeah, light and depth of field. And right. I, I like the people to, to kind of blend into the surroundings to, to a degree. Sure. So that they, it feels like they belong and, and they're part of those surroundings, but still separate them with light and depth of field. Sure. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, and then Lorne would like to know, um, it says, Wayne is a great workshop leader. He's very good at drawing out people and getting them to figure out how to get the shot. <laughs> awesome. So nice, Lorne. Um, <laughs> and Bert says, uh, love your marketing plan. <laughs> Looking forward to the book. Um, and then I think the last question that we've got is, what is your process? process or structure for developing your workshops and how much time do you devote from start to finish? Um, I wouldn't say I have an exact process. Um, I've been doing a, a workshop series for a few years now with, with Dave Brosha. Mm -hmm. um, it's called Character. So we've, we've traveled doing that workshop a fair bit. And then I've got a couple that I've done on my own as well. Um, it's really just when I see trends and things that people are asking questions about or, sure. um, you know, people are hungry to know about those certain things. So then I'll, I'll kind of look back at my own images and figure out how I can address that and, and teach people. I guess right that's, that's kind of my lead really. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And it makes sense because usually your audience will let you know what they want to know. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and last, Thing. Last comment before we start to close. Katrina says, thank you both for the wonderful interview. So informative. And she says, congrats on your upcoming book release. Hoping for a local launch. I'm a big fan of your poignant, thoughtful image. Awesome. Well, thank you. <laughs> so nice. Yeah, it will be a local. Yeah, I assume that person is local here. Um, I'm, I'm guessing so. <laughs> yeah, there will definitely be something here. Right on, yeah. right on, right on. Um, cool. Wayne, this has been such a great conversation. I love hearing about what motivates you and how you are approaching these subjects and your passion for the people and the work that you're creating. I can't wait to see where that takes you. Um, you definitely have a fan in me, so I will be following <laughs> on well, most closely. That. Um, to everybody who joined us today on the social hour, um, Gary and Tiffin Box, Lorne, Craig, everybody who is here, thank you guys so much. And for your really thought provoking questions as well. I can't tell you how much I appreciate having you guys join us for conversations like this. And if you find these interviews useful, I would love it if you would like the image, subscribe, maybe share if you think you know other people who could benefit from finding out really cool information from awesome people like Wayne. So thank you guys for being here. Um, coming up on the docket for this, actually tomorrow I will be interviewing an amazing photographer named Bryce Chapman who has not only really extraordinary portraits um, but also does some pretty incredible um, conceptual work as well. So definitely be here for that. And then excuse me, Bella Kotek will be here on the 12th. So if you're a fan of fantasy photography and, you know, beautiful kind of otherworldly fairy tales, be here to, to talk to Bella because she is amazing. So again, um, Wayne, I will end our live stream and then say goodbye to you in private. But thank you guys so much for being here. I hope you will join me tomorrow. And until then, bye everybody.